there was a lot of sort of talk by you, Mr. Riazzi, about the, 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 so the unintended consequences of the technology choices we're making in some ways, right? And what I was kind of wondering whether I could actually press you to think about something that makes you optimistic, each of you or one of you, right? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you sit on the Humanitarian Innovation Fund and you see these mm -hmm. projects come through, yeah. right? So I'm kind of, before we go into this of the, the bigger challenges, I do want to kind of remind everybody that there is some optimism there as well. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So since you mentioned the Humanitarian Innovation Fund, I think I'm very optimistic because I've seen some very interesting things developing. Um, first of all, this data exchange program, which is being launched by OCHA, is actually going to be, it, it came from the Innovation Fund, and it, it, it really brings together all the different practitioners and volunteers to be able to share information and how we make some sense out of it and analysis. Mm -hmm. But if I can tell you another story, uh, is that one of the projects we funded was actually Danish Refugee Commission in uh, monitoring their programs and accountability to affected people using SMS platforms, using frontline SMS and so on and so forth um, in uh, Somalia. Uh, what was interesting was, well, they did manage to get feedback from uh, affected people on whether they were happy with the programs, but the, there's one of the unintended uh, effects was that the diaspora was watching this because it was all open platform, it was really visible on the web, and really found that the organization was doing some pretty decent work and that you know, good programming was actually uh, you know, able to, was able to be uh, delivered to, be, to the uh, intended beneficiaries. And as a result, the diaspora actually then channeled funds to strengthen the program uh, so that more people could actually be assisted uh, uh, through that. So I think, you know, I think, you know, I hope I didn't paint doom and gloom. I really wanted to paint this issue that we need to have an ethical framework that we work with uh, on, on, on in these areas. But the second thing is how do we really try to address it from a people perspective? Uh, and, and I think the role of volunteers are so important. Uh, but how do we find that intersection? So I think mm. there is a, a lot of hope. I've just come from a, an hour with our teams from um, Sierra Leone and Liberia talking about Ebola, so I'm not in the most optimistic um, <laughs> mood. But I think there are two things that are very significant. One is the growth of organized civil society amongst the beneficiaries of the work that we're doing. I mean, that, that is a, a real revolution that's going on, I think. And so... Uh, sometimes facilitated by technology, but often not. Yeah. But the the organising that's going on amongst displaced communities is a, is really very very striking. And you've got um, mobilised people, uh, I think, which is important and and is where you're seeing progress. The second thing, I mean, it's tempting in an audience like this always to find high tech sort of solutions. The most inspiring thing I've, that, that I've learned in the last year is the program that we're running in parts of Africa, which is cutting uh, pneumonia death rates among kids. We found that 22% um, of nurses and parents in, our, in the communities that we work in were able to diagnose pneumonia amongst the kids that they were uh, uh, notionally responsible for. And the reason was, fundamentally, that while the WHO had distributed lots of watches for them to uh, time a minute, uh, the people weren't able to count up to 30 or 40 the number of breaths that a child was yeah. um, uh, using. And obviously, if you have more breaths, you've, it's a bad indicator. Um, we've, we, we produce these um, beads that look like a necklace, so every child's breath, you just move one bead along, and at the end... It's the an minute, abacus. Sorry? It's, it's a an necklace. It's called a necklace. After, after, a, after, a, after a minute, the WHO... Um, timer goes off, and if your beads have turned to red, you know the kid's got new, likely to have pneumonia, and so you go from a 22% detection rate to a 66% detection uh, rate. And so I think that one of the things that I most uh, admire about the IRC since I joined it is the practical intelligence mm -hmm. that can come to bear from actually listening to, and we came for, to this by actually talking to the nurses and the parents about why they were unable to diagnose, and it's a simple matter of not being able to count. And so I think that that's the kind of practical intelligence that makes me optimistic. 
So um, thank you for that question. You know, when I look at the London fog of 1952, it actually resulted in a Clean Air Act. So we look at these issues, and I think we may be pessimistic on one level, but we're extremely optimistic because I believe technology and innovation can truly address these big issues that we're talking about. Um, if we just take a step back, so um, there are unintended consequences, but some are positive. Not all are negative. Many of them are positive. So the question for us as technologists is, do we have the sophistication, do we have the understanding to predict um, and uh, what will happen as a result of the innovation? And um, I'll just close with this. I mean, do we know, you look at big, big data, do we know that two inches less rain today in South Sudan would cause unrest in three years? That is such an important information for us to know because if we can predict and correlate data, environmental data, social data, economic data, um, agricultural data, then we can respond a lot better and a lot faster to crisis, but right now we don't. The data is, 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 uh, is not connected, therefore we operate in, in dark. So I do believe there's an immense power that technology brings um, if we can harness it and if we could work together to, uh, to address these big social issues. Thank you. Turns out that people were posting in the last sessions little moderator question queue, not this one. So I was not quite correct in harassing the audience, but they're gonna have to say it verbally rather than look at it online. Um, so before I go to some of those questions, I did think about, uh, is it as simple as give everyone a cell phone? Right? Because you talked, David, about economic empowerment being a way forward, and there's clear links between sort of access to information, access to cellular technology with economic growth. Causality is a little bit fuzzy as far as I can tell, right? Is it as simple as information as aid, comms as aid, right? Is that what we should be aiming for? Well, obviously it's not. I mean, yeah. uh, the, uh, <laughs> so. if, if you've got a cell phone but you can't charge it, if you've got a cell phone but you can't pay for your connectivity, um, uh, then it's obviously not. But d does, does a smartphone, as opposed to a cell phone, give you potential to become an, an actor in writing, you know, a writer in a writer of your own biography in a way that uh, you, you can't if you don't. Yes, of course, but I think that, I mean, one of the things I always say to people is that you've got to be careful in thinking that deep social, economic, and political structures and problems are going to have a technological fix. They're going to have a human fix. And the technology can either help or hinder. And the truth is that bad actors are doing as many bad things with technology as good actors are doing good things. I mean, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the double-edged nature of it. And so um, I think that we, don't, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't undermine or demean our own understanding of the power of technology by thinking that just a sort of hardware distribution is going to solve things. I mean, I've got lots of staff in DRC who've got smartphones, but they can't video conference with me. Yeah. And that's, uh, so, so the problem is a bigger problem than the absence of a, of a smartphone. And I think that um, we, we just have to be, I mean, I know you are conscious of it, but we, we just have to be, a, if Google's plan to um, cut connection charges, to, to have this cl cloudless global um, connectivity works, then we're in a whole new world. But until we get there, we're not. I, I want to maybe challenge that a little bit because I think we've got to also start thinking. I think we have a real problem as humanitarians, certainly, to look at things on a, at a pretty short time frame. Uh, our, our lifespan and looking at emergencies because we're so overloaded, it's like two to three years. I'd like us to imagine what it's going to be like in 2050 where you know, the world is completely different, and how then do we work backwards, and how do we use that technology to leverage? I, I, I look at my kids, and you know, they, they belong to that generation that everything is through you know, mobile apps and so forth. And I think that we gotta get the young people on board with us, and 
try to get them to be these change agents that actually, you know, we were talking to young people in South Africa who were saying that use us to reduce risky behavior of people going into terrorist groups and so forth. And we use technology to do that through our social media and so forth. I mean, you're absolutely right about, you know, the, the problem with interstate conflict and be, because of the imbalances and all, all the other issues. And I think we've got to start using technology in a really savvy way and try to think about how we influence young people in actually creating a better future. Otherwise, we really, you know, it'd be pointless. We'd just be stuck in this uh, situation. So I want to remain an optimist. I'm an incurable optimist. My team members will tell you that I think things can be solved. But we've got to look at it on a longer term vision. We're going to suffer before we come to a better a better situation, I think, and I think uh, technology will play an important role. And I think there has been more good people using it than the bad people. Uh, and, you know, we just have to create the environment. So we've, the group of people in this room are sort of responsible in part for creating and certainly stimulating a lot of the sort of mapping tools that are now used every day by actors in the field, whether it's OpenStreetMap or whether it's some of the Google tools or whether it's just some of the new survey tools, right? And validating them as well, not just creating them, but actually sort of finding out what works. And we've got some very, I, I'm proud to say, some fairly sophisticated thinkers about how communities use them as well, right? Um, so one of the things that I, I get challenged by is to say, well, how could this powerful group of people then address some of these issues? So. If you had a wish, right, what would it be right, for some of these folks? Right? Because we can design better survey tools, we can make analytic models, uh, we, can, we can drive uh, sort of hopefully better and more complete maps of the world. Right? But that's only one, you know, mapping is a, an understanding, but it's one understanding. Right? So what would your wish be if, if these people could sort of focus their laser energy somewhere? Reza? So, um, you know, you mentioned analytical models. Uh, I do believe uh, the, um, the next revolution is data revolution. It is understanding. We make a lot of decisions without really understanding the cause and the effect, without understanding the fundamental issues. So I do think uh, analytics and, and modeling is critical for us to have a better understanding of when and where the crisis will happen. Um, I also want to raise one more area because um, if you look at a country like Rwanda, it has uh, 10 million people, 400 doctors. And the traditional way of handling and addressing disease uh, is, is just not working. I mean, we can't get enough doctors there. So can technology, can we create expert systems that would diagnose and do triage um, and help assist the limited number of doctors to cover a lot more people? I think the application of technology in areas of healthcare um, is, has to expand, especially in emerging markets, where we can get enough um, health professionals in. So I'm, I'm a big believer that technology can help address that, but we have to begin innovation. The problem is we don't innovate when, uh, when there is no money in it. You look at Ebola, we could have created and come up with a virus 20, 30 years ago. We didn't. So at what point is a break-even point for the private sector to say, yes, I will create, uh, the technology to address basic health issues in Africa, in developing markets that don't have money to pay for it. Sounds great. Let me see if there's a question from the floor. Several. Uh, who's got the mics? Yep. Up oh, behind first. You're next, Sanjana. Um, again, I'd like to thank you all of the, the panel. You were extremely inspiring. Uh, my name is Jerry Hush, and um, I've been the, I was the UNDP accountability specialist as well as the UNICEF accountability specialist. So when you started to talk about accountability, it immediately flagged, uh, flagged me. And one of the major issues was data monitoring and the ability to have a system where we can go from the policy all the way down to the ground and that we can have mutual accountability from those people who make the decisions down to the policy. And my question to you, and I'm, I guess in some ways I'm going to challenge you as leaders. One of the major issues that we had, we have the technology to monitor. We have the technology to bring the data in. What we don't have, and this is the challenge, 
is the moral integrity of leaders to actually use the data and to accept the findings and the evidence that we have. And that was a huge issue. We went to the executive board, we developed all sorts of wonderful plans for accountability, and every single one of them has gathered dust. So I'm asking you, how can you use the data that is now available in your positions of decision, decision makers and as leaders so that we can continue to provide insights that are based on the current context and that they're not ignored? I mean, my experience of this is that unless you say publicly what you're going to do, you don't get held, held to account yep. for it. And so um, we are um, very committed in IRC to try to bridge what is a massive evidence gap. I mean, it's not just that there is evidence that's being kept secret. Look, my statistics are that in the development space, in stable states that are tackling poverty, since 2006, there have been 2,500 randomized control trials or equivalent studies. Um, of what works. In the humanitarian space, there have been 45. As it happens, IRC has done 18 of them, and we've got 14 more in the pipeline. So we are the, sort of, we've done a plurality of them. Mm. But the field as a whole has underinvested in evidence gathering, sometimes for quote unquote moral reasons. Look, in the middle of an emergency, you don't want a control group of people who don't get helped. But that's not a good enough reason because the truth is you want to test out different ways of helping people it's not that some people get helped and others get nothing the it's medical kind of, community's been dealing with this for yeah. decades uh, so so I'm, i don't i don't think it's uh, I, I think that the pressure of action has interfered with the need for clarity of thought and but, uh, we're starting a new five-year plan in, in in january and it will put at its heart evidence however you cannot commit yourself to evidence unless you're also clear about your outcomes mm. And the outcomes debate has to be prior to the evidence debate. And unless you're willing to do both, to be clear about the outcome so that you know what you're measuring, and then the commitment to use evidence once you have done your measurement, I don't think you're going to uh, make a change. And, uh, but I do think the commitment to, to publish it is absolutely key. So you've got to be willing to expose your own um, limitations as well as your successes. I think um, you know that question you pose is the same question we're posing as a summit to all our regional consultations because it's so easy to talk about accountability to affected people and yet so so difficult to see it actually being implemented and in action. I think we have improved over the number of years because of you know the pressure from certain groups and so on and so forth. The reality is this. I think it has to be public. I, this is why it's not a joke. I think we should have a Yelp for, for, for humanitarian accountability that people, you know, affected people can actually complain and can actually be in the public domain. But we also have to have donor behavior that, that is appropriate because right now there is no, there's no action taken if an organization actually doesn't is not accountable. No, I must salute IRC because they work in DRC where they actually exposed that, you know, what they had been doing didn't really have the impact they wanted. But because of that ability to, to pr produce that evidence and be honest about it, actually earned them a lot of brownie points. Because when you can be honest and admit that there is a problem, only then you can find a solution and, and try to, to build in the learning that you know that you've you've gained from from making mistakes. So we have all these lessons learned that, that are never learned, uh, but we need to have incentives as much as disincentives. I think, that, but I think there should be incentives for learning, uh, and that at the end of the day, and I'm going to get into trouble for saying this publicly, but um, you know it is donor behavior. It's how donors uh, behave towards the agencies that they fund. Oh, God, I'm going to lose my job in two years, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. I think the Secretary General knew what he was doing when he asked you to do this, right? Um, so uh, it, it does lead me to something you mentioned earlier, David, where if you move from a, a live saved perspective to a survival perspective, right, it's a more qualitatively measure initially, right? Um, at Google, one of the things, you know, we're a data company, we're a metrics company, we're a we, we want the numbers to make decisions, right? So 
what are the what are the metrics there? Because to some extent, the mapping community are acting as sensors and trying to make intelligence, whether it's from big data or from human surveys and, and other things, right? And underlying information. So what what do we need to evaluate success in a in a survival world rather than a? Well, look, take the, there's nothing like doing it in the real world. Uh, think about Ebola. Mm -hmm. I mean, the truth is, the absolute cold truth is we have statistics for the number of people who've got Ebola, we, I mean, the international yep. community has, but we don't know if they're true. Uh, we have, therefore, have figures for survival Well, rates. they're not true, but how untrue? <laughs> uh, the, the, okay, so, so we don't know how, whether they're true or not. I mean, the, the, um, the survival rates, therefore, and not a reliable guide. Now, w w what's important about that to me is the reason they're unreliable is that people are fearful of reporting, not just because there isn't good enough surveillance. Yeah. And that speaks to this fundamental point that if you're trying to use technology to fight against communities, you're going to lose. Mm. Mobilizing the will of affected populations. So in this case, it's in their interest to report but even if it doesn't save them, it might save the rest of their family, is absolutely key. The alignment of incentives is at the heart of this. And maybe that's another reason why there isn't a quote-unquote technological fix, but I think that the survival metrics there is, is a, it's a really powerful example of how you, we, we do know what it would mean to have proper metrics, but we don't have them because we're not trusted. Nigel, can I go back to your previous question about modeling? Sure. Because I think it's important, and I'm, I'm making a sales pitch here. We really need people to come and really try to model the world, the future. And we also need to look at that data that we have now. And I was just saying earlier that are the actors who are actually doing humanitarian action right now on the assumptions that we make with data, are they really effective? And are we able to really have real evidence on what is effective humanitarian action? I think the data is out there. We just need smarter people you know, who are not humanitarians to look at it from a very fresh perspective. And uh, the other modeling thing is that, you know, what is the world we're looking at now in 2050? What is it going to look like? If we can use the science, the evidence uh, that predicts the, what the world is, is going to be like, then we need to start doing a little bit more forward planning. I think we, we, can ha we will have to be you know, stuck in the current challenges that we have, but unless we have people looking at future planning, I think we're always going to be playing catch up. Great, please. Could I, could I comment on that? I, I, I look at our mandates as you and, and uh, world peace is on top of the list, and you think, well, how do you measure that? How, how do you know whether you've affected world peace? It is a, um, and how, how do you do that every day when you, you see that the world peace seemed to be only the problem of the UN, the NGOs, and just the government, mm -hmm. and nobody else cares? So it is a difficult um, goal to address, I mean, you look at climate change, environment, children, protect the children globally. That lies on the shoulders of the NGOs and the governments and the UN. How do you do that? So I just think when we look at our mandates and our goals, these are huge goals and, and issues, serious issues, that it's only solvable if we get the private sector engaged and involved, not around the perimeter, but fully involved as partners. So we can solve it together. Because if the rest of the world says, and how effective are you in bringing world peace, that just doesn't resolve anything. So I, I, do, I don't see, I see partnership in pockets, but truly I don't see the public-private partnership to address big social issues. And I think the effectiveness will go up when the private sector realizes that addressing uh, the famine issues, the food issue, the water issue, the climate change issues will bring profit, but it would make a better world. And, and how do we come together for that partnership? Probably Sanjana was actually waiting, then John, and then we'll go on from there. Thank you very much. Um, congratulations on, on all three speakers. I have questions for all three of you, one each. Um, to the first speaker, you actually touched on the question I wanted to ask. What I wanted to know was, in your opinion, as the Chief Information Technology Officer, a role that wasn't there even a couple of years ago, is the role of the UN in addressing some of the issues that we talked about today. 
is it the case that the UN is now increasingly going to hand over its responsibilities in terms of innovation to the private sector, knowing full well, as you said, that that's where possibly the, 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 the greatest minds are? Uh, are you going to outsource that, or are you going to embrace it and then try to more organically create it within the UN in terms of some of the, some of the solutions? Ironically, as you full well know, in the Secretariat, the closer you get to the Security Council, the greater your signal loss in the cell phone is. It may be that there is a very, there's a person in the UN who has a very dark sense of humor, but you know, it, sends, it, it resonates with sometimes what we feel is the UN being rather anachronistic in its engagement with some of the resources, human resources in this room. To the second speaker, I think you flagged the asymmetry between the focus on the foci of this community on specific geographical loci and issues and disasters and crises as opposed to the more hidden, the more marginal, but certainly also the equally pressing and challenging. It reflects back to the question about political accountability that I think Mr. Miliband, with respect, you kind of dodged. Um, it, it, the question is, with all of the resources that we have today to understand that something is going to occur, and this harks back to a conversation that Patrick Ma and I have been having for years around early warning. Is it the case today that we are comfortable in the knowledge that those in authority, like yourselves, will take the decisions that need to be taken in order to, quite frankly, save lives? And I am not entirely convinced, but I would like to see where you stand in this, because I think it goes to the heart of the matter. Uh, does it mean that the more technology we have, the greater the disconnect between uh, the political will and authority and what we know when we should know it? Uh, to Mr. Miliband in particular, I think uh, the, the, the question to you is institutional and institutions. If we are to take on board what you said about institutions being more reactive, uh, being more responsive, what does that actually mean? If the expectation is around accountability, what does that mean for institutions today moving forward if we really are serious about being accountable to the people we are working with? Does that mean, for example, your job is on the line if the perception, the dominant perception, is that IRC has failed to deliver? Uh, nothing like a light question, a set of <laughs> questions there. Um, I think let's tackle one, one of them briefly. Yep. Um, um, I think great questions, yeah. and uh, I, I believe UN is very open to those strategic alliances, um, especially in the technology world, to see how we could together uh, address some of these issues. So, uh, uh, and we are looking at our mandates, just like the private sector looks at its its goals and um, and sees uh, where technology is impacting its mission and its vision. We are looking at that, and technology does have huge impact on the way we deliver on our mandates. Um, so that partnership is really critical, and we are opening up to uh, to our friends and. Uh, our, our partners to resolve some of these issues. I absolutely agree with everything you said because um, it worries me, for example, a slow genocide in Myanmar is happening. Uh, when I first went to Myanmar during the cyclone, a SIM card cost 2,000 US dollars. Now it's res readily available uh, over the counter, $2,000 for a SIM card. Um, and, and, you know, 2,000 ringgit, I'm sorry, it was uh, $500, $600. But anyway, the, the reality is that, that we, we have people inside the Rakhine state who have mobile phones. We have so much bad propaganda being, being you know, not just in Myanmar, but also in the alliance between Myanmar and Sri Lanka now uh, on the 969. But yet, you know, we're not able to tackle it. You know, politicians know, leaders know that there's an issue, but there's a reluctance. So I think, you know, um, you started it this, this earlier to talk about, you know, the lack of leadership, which is a real, you know, lead, we have a leadership gap in so many areas. And I think, you know, this is why many humanitarian situations cannot be solved by humanitarian actors. Let's face it, a lot of the conflict that is going on in this world requires political solutions. And the humanitarian actors can only do so much, and we need to recognize that we can only do so much. As far as the UN is concerned, I think the, the fact that the Secretary General has asked us to do this summit 
and opening it up, not just to member states, but really having conversations with affected people, with victims of rape, with you know, uh, people living in camps, and bringing them to the same rooms to have those discussions on what their needs and what they want, I think is a huge step forward. Um, but uh, it, it will be a challenge, the reality is. I wanted to leave time for more questions, but very briefly, look, humanitarianism can staunch the dying, but it takes politics to stop the killing. And that's the limitation that Jamila has referred to, and it's a, and it's a very powerful one. Secondly, I'm, I, it's actually an easy question. Of course I should be, my job should be on the line if people who we're serving don't like the services that we're delivering. The scorecard on me should be about the impact that we're having. It should also be about the, the cost per unit of impact. And it should also be about the perception of the impact. And uh, we're a long way from that. I think that's an easy question to answer. I mean, that's what, if, if 360 degree feedback doesn't mean that, then it doesn't mean anything. Okay. Um, question coming from the back, and then I'll get a couple from further in the front. Yep. Sure. My name is John Crowley. Disaster reduction recovery. Um, I have a question on uh, practical knowledge. Uh, we heard how a simple solution can work in many uh, circumstances. The this room is filled with people who have been working on simple solutions, straightforward solutions, beginning to put data together around Ebola and other crises. Uh, we often are blocked in the, in, the, in the space because we face a circumstance where traditional workflows lock uh, data into a narrative that needs to be communicated up a food chain that's accountable only upward. And these efforts of trying to bring very simple uh, ways of putting the picture together with data get frozen and then locked out. What is it going to take for the humanitarian system to be honest and to let this data flow and to let the data be put together into pictures that allow things to change on the ground? I think being called out. Uh, look, the, 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 the only thing, the reason things stay secret is that there's no pressure for them to be open. Mm. I mean, the, 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 the truth about the modern world is that the, the arguments for, uh, privilege, for secrecy are, are, are very weak, and the, the, the collapse of the distinction between public and private is, is a feature of, of life. I always say to people, look, people will forgive you for being wrong. They, w they won't forgive you for being a hypocrite. Yeah. And if people are preaching the virtues of openness but practicing the vices of secrecy, then they need to be called out. And that's why I think Jamila gave the example of, uh, so I'm not, I'm not sort of tootling my own trumpet on this, my predecessors did a, a massive uh, randomized control trial on uh, a, govern a new governance system in the DRC. It wasn't achieving the goals that it had um, uh, set out. We published the evidence. We actually got kudos for publishing the evidence. The donor, which was the UK government, actually uh, took the right decision, which was to say, let's improve the program, not, not let's junk the program. And, that, and that's, the, that's the right way. But I think the, the truth is that the, whichever the organizations are that you're referring to, they're not being called out. So I, I wonder in the context of the crisis mapping we're talking about, which is ultimately about sort of communicating and visualizing sort of in that exact context, is it, do you think it's about, I've heard themes of this already, is it about a a lack of data for journalists, for instance, to pick up and tell stories from? Or is it the fact that it's missing the next level of compelling visualization that makes it even easier in a, in a world with fewer journalistic investigative resources to then spread? Right? Is, it, is it a source problem or is it a sort of end user design problem? My, my instinct, I mean, I'd be interested in what you, yeah. the question of things, but my instinct is on the Ebola, which you mentioned, I think it's a source problem, actually. Yeah. But I, I mean, I might be wrong. I mean, you, you, you thought there is the data there. Or it's locked, in a curate, locked into a curation process that delays its release or is put behind closed firewalls that are accessible only to a few people. And in, is, there's no way of putting it together with the other pieces of data that are necessary for seeing the whole picture. And I would call out WHO very strongly on that particular count. Okay. I, probably not more to say than yes uh, on that particular piece. Uh, I could get started. I'm not sure about other people here. Um, 
I might, unless there's a comment on that, I might ask a question. There was someone down the front here who wanted to ask something. Yep. Um, I had a question about how um, private partnerships and private-public partnerships and a lot of these countries that have very so systemic issues and are well. very vulnerable to disaster but also have very challenging development issues. Um, international industry, I believe, and a lot of other people have said, have a lot to do with this in the way in which, you know, the monies that they make aren't necessarily translating to the countries that they're extracting from, if you will. So isn't part of that public-private partnership, you know, how do you kind of overcome that challenge of, you know, exploitative industry as private industry and also, you know, as large organizations playing a large role in that due to, you know, the political, whatever you want to call it, you know, the, the, the walk around that you, you, you don't hold each other accountable in that space. How, how would we address that to make institutions more effective? Well, I think, you know, at the end of the day, we have to recognize that governments will do what they want anyway, whether institutions tell them or whatever it is. What we need to do is, I think, engage with the private sector, and I, I think they know. They know the damage, damage that they're doing in many of the environments that they work, but how do we create, you know, incentives for them to do better? Um, and just to, you know, to give you an example that, you know, <laughs> this is going to be very political. As, uh, okay. We if can we can, if, you like. <laughs> if we can get, I mean, I have been approached by a number of um, very successful businesses uh, from a certain country uh, that do a lot of extraction. Uh, who are now beginning to feel a little bit guilty that, you know, maybe they've extracted too much from certain parts of the world uh, and, you know, trying to find ways and how do, you, do they actually give back, right? So it's, it's tricky. I mean, we talk about shared value where businesses must do business and create impact to communities and so on and so forth. So I think we need to have, you know, really clever models where we can actually work with the private sector and say, how do we create shared value in some of the things that you do? You can extract, but how do you convince corporations to make 10 billion in 50 years rather than in five years? So, you know, so at the end of the day, it's about morals, isn't it? It's about moral, moral judgment by, by leaders in corporations and, you know, and how do shareholders also behave in this? So it's, it's a very complex and very, you know, it's, it's not easy and not straightforward. And the United Nations, uh, to be honest, I think many people misunderstand what the United Nations really is. It's actually just a bunch of member states that, you know, work around certain resolutions and so on and so forth. It has no executive power, so to speak, to, to demand private sector to do this and that. At the end of the day, it's still national governments that have the, the corporations investing in their countries that have to, to lay the, the, the rules. So, um, again, it comes down to leadership. You know, perhaps we have a, a global problem with leadership. We need to have many, many more leaders that are able to hold private sector to account. So Now I won't even get a job yeah. in government. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've got one more question because we've had a, a bunch of these people's time. Um, so, yep. Um, this question is for David, but I'd be disappointed if the ladies don't give an answer. Um, you said you gave a hundred dollar credit to refugees and you did research on it. Can you speak to the difference between giving that money to a male and a female? Question. Great question. Um, for, for two reasons. It's, it, what it was was $100 a month for six months instead of giving um, winterization kits. And uh, it's a great question for two reasons. One, the data gathering showed that um, a relatively small minority, I think it was 27%, I stand to be corrected on that, um, were women, and it was in the main going to um, male heads of households. So that's kind of the power of data. Um, there. But uh, secondly, uh, amongst the qualitative uh, data that we uh, generated, it showed some quite significant impacts on tension within households. I mean, I don't want to overclaim uh, for the data, and, it's, and the data is all published, and you, know, you, can, you can go and look at it on the website. But um, it did, for, for, in part for the obvious reason, which is that households that exhibit high levels of income stress are also 
uh, correlated with higher levels of domestic violence. Um, but what, I, what our research didn't quite get into um, was whether or not giving them, the extent to which giving the money to the woman rather than to the man made a big difference on that. So, there's, so there was really interesting um, data that came out of it. It also showed, I mean, we were able to do it for a very peculiar reason. This, the, 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 um, I think it was a UN, actually. I don't, I'm sorry if this is not true, but I think it was a UN. They, they said that the winterization money should only go to Lebanese villages that were more than 500 meters above sea level. So we were able to compare families in villages 500 meters above sea level with those 490 meters above sea level who are effectively facing the same climatic conditions, but we had an effective control group um, created. Not, it's not always that you get that kind of thing, but the money went to host communities as well as to refugee communities, and we did see less tension there. And one of the ways in which uh, the IRC has had to develop over the last 20 years is that since you've got more refugees and displaced people in urban areas, if you don't help the host population, you end up with a lot of tension. So we've had to become an agency that's, that's doing more with host communities as well as with uh, displaced people, which is kind of interesting. Can I build on that? Because Please. I think it's a really important question. I mean, if we look at what has been done, uh, for example, in the field of microfinance, uh, say, you know, if you know about what Yunus and Grameen and all these uh, models, where they actually found that giving money to women actually had better outcomes than men, and also they paid back most of the time. Uh, I think that this, uh, it's without a doubt that if you actually give things to women, they prioritize differently. For example, they, if you look at development issues, they prioritize things like education for their children and so on and so forth. It's not to say men are bad. It's that women handle money differently uh, than men. I think where we in the humanitarian sector are doing is really having a much more gender, you know, a, a gender balanced perspective on how we actually deliver assistance. I think it's really, really important. But we also have to take into consideration culture. Now, one of the things when Yunus, I had the pleasure of talking to him, and, and I said, how did you deal with this in Bangladesh, which is predominantly quite a patriarchal uh, society? How, how did women fare when you gave money to them? Did it cause you know, tensions in the house? He says, yes. But at the end of the day, you know, because they persisted, uh, then you know, they could actually then educate the men to say you know, it is in good hands. So I think we, we need to put more trust uh, and make more efforts in actually put putting money in, in women's hands. And I think where innovation has really made an impact is the mobile uh, cash and you know, electronic transfers. I think that's been really one of the biggest and best innovations. Great. OK. Well, what I might do uh, is say thank you very much for your time. But I wanted to leave you with one question, which was that back to my early one about a wish, I won't frame it quite like that, is that we've got the room of people who work on everything from satellite imagery to crowdsourcing to surveys uh, to a, a range of other things under a very broad manner of crisis mapping. But it really includes a whole range of things about understanding the world in which these crises are occurring. So what's, what's the next step you'd like from these people? Right? If you wanted them to go away and work on something, what would it be? My wish is that you email me at david.miliband at rescue.org and you tell me which problem you'd like to solve. Mm. Uh, and I will then find the country director or the field coordinator or um, uh, the right person for you to try and solve the problem. And uh, what, what I can offer is, a, is an extraordinary network of 12,000 people in 35 countries who are working with we think 15 million people a year, beneficiaries. And so um, we, we, we need to become much better customers and partners of the kind of expertise that's here. And the only way we can do that is if we try and, is if we try and sit you either virtually or in reality in, 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 with these people and figure out, well, this, you know, why, why have you got this problem on connectivity in DRC? Why have you got this issue on security in, Le in Lebanon? Why have you got this issue on uh, data in uh, Sierra Leone, let's try and work yeah. on it. So I, I, would, I would second. Uh, I, I, absolutely, <laughs> I am emailing you. Um, so uh, there, 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 there are so many issues to focus on. But one thing we wanted to do is open up the data we have within UN and ask that you participate in helping us analyze, predict, correlate, and understand going forward. 
Uh, but the two key areas for us um, right now, and especially for me, one is this, this issue of 80% of child trafficking happening online. And our capability to be able to understand, see, and, and uh, assist is really limited. So how do we work in a cyber world? That is a big dilemma. How do we operate there? How do we um, understand? How do we stop? So I think this is a big area for all of us, 1.2 million um, children being affected and women. Um, that is a huge number. The, so I, I hope that's one area. The other area is really cyber, cyber crime and the, the um, cyber security. We, we will, yeah, we actually have it today, the issue of cyber security of different member states the, with the industrial systems being extremely weak. Um, and, uh, and what do we do? Uh, you know, we can, um, we have to have a plan so the partnership in that space in strengthening the uh, industrial systems of, of ourselves, the different countries, being able to see the activities, prevent, stop, assist. I think those are the big areas for us that we're tackling with. So conversation, assistance, partnership um, is welcomed in all areas, but those areas are key. I have three asks. The first one is that we have a specific theme on innovation. Uh, in our World Humanitarian Summit, I need ideas on where you think, what are the critical innovation, what, criti what do we really need to do to really transform humanitarian action in all the areas that I mentioned earlier. The second big ask is I really need people to look at data um, on some of the aspects, big data, and trying to, as I said, mention, anal analyze the really what are the efficiencies where and build that evidence um, base for us that perhaps the current structures and institutions we have right now are really not best fit for addressing some of the future challenges that we have. The third thing is please contact us. I mean, really anything that you can offer we will take because it's about, you know, using you know, people's ideas and minds, and you know, we need some really bold ideas uh, to help us face future challenges. But the modeling aspect is very important. Uh, Sebastian and I are both here. Uh, anyone, you know, please grab a card from me or whatever. Please, we want to stay in touch with you, uh, and we do need your help. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and uh, your passion. Yeah. Okay.